I want to begin with this uh, article Wanda gave me by Noah Hutchings. It's called uh, Contemporary Cannibalism. I'm only going to read a short uh, section of it for you. Uh, that caught my eye on Pepsi and the fact that when you read this and, and you start thinking about many other areas in which uh, they're using uh, the abortion murder industry and they're using these babies for commercial purposes. It's not just a, a matter of murdering them which is bad enough, but there's also motive and commercial purposes behind it. This section is talking about Pepsi-Cola, and it says the Pepsi-Cola company has been reported in many news media sources as using aborted baby cells for favor enhancement in Pepsi-Cola. But Pepsi, perhaps many other producers besides soft drink and Pepsi, is just one of many doing this, I could quote from many news sources reporting that at least 100 food items that housewives housewives buy every day now contain chemicals and other included food enhancers such or made which are made from aborted babies. I quote just a few lines from the lengthy article on this subject from the Natural News from March 17th uh, 2012, the Obama administration has given its blessings to Pepsi-Cola to continue utilizing services of a company that produces flavor chemicals for the beverage giant using aborted human fetal tissues. LifeSiteNews.com reports that the Obama Security and Exchange Commission, the SEC, has decided that Pepsi-Cola's arrangement with San Diego, Cal, um, California-based uh, Cinemex, S-E-N-O-M-E-Y-X, which produces flavor-enhancing chemicals for Pepsi-Cola using human embryos, kidney tissues, uh, simply constitutes, quote, ordinary business operations, end of quote. That's pretty Deuteronomy sick. 2853 Deuteronomy 2853. Now shall eat the fruit of thy own body. Absolutely. Yep. Huh. Wow. Mormon Church owns a Pepsi company. Well, news. The truth is coming out, folks, and it's for the truth seekers. That's who it's for. The rest of the people aren't paying attention. All right. Now, um, this one's a good one. George sent me on. Congressman Stockman introduces hilarious Dog Ate My Tax Receipts Act. I mean, you've been following that on Lois uh, Lerner of the uh, IRS. Um, a week after the IRS announced it would not produce emails from former exempt organizations division Director Lois Lerner, Texas Congressman Steve Stockman, introduced the Dog Ate My Tax Receipts Act. I I have to stop here and say it's all a scam. Um, Our Congress is not there working to get truth. It's not there working for justice. If you believe that, uh, I've got a... uh, Bridge from where? From San Diego to Phoenix, Arizona to sell you. Whatever. A swamp land in Phoenix. Uh, There might be some, but it's very rare. Anyway, if you're on the, if you, if the government comes after you, you know what they're going to do to you? They're going to say, they're going to form a grand jury. And they're going to use a grand jury or a regular jury, either one. And they're going to, and they're going to make sure you understand at the beginning that if you lie to them and if you refuse to answer, we're going to hold you in contempt of court. And if you lie to us, we will put you in jail. I mean, they make, they put the fear of God in you right at the very beginning. How many of you follow me? And they, they have so many, uh, 
weapons at their disposal, legal weapons at their disposal that they can unleash upon you when you're in the courtroom and they put you on that uh, stand to give oath or testimony. Do they do that to any of our, uh, the, our political leaders that they put on trial? Did they do that to the IRS, this lady, Lois Lerner? They don't do it to any of them. And so it comes back later, well, I was mistaken, or I forgot, or this and that. And they're always perjuring themselves and getting away with it. They have this double standard for the high elites. They want to send the message, we're doing our bidding, we've hired you on to do this, and don't worry, we'll take care of you. We're not going to put you on the regular court in a regular court system that the average American has to go through. You follow me? Yeah. Yeah, they're above the law. So anyway, it's um it's a whole list here and it's it's kind of funny, you know, like number one, the dog ate my tax receipts. Number two, convenient unexplained miscellaneous computer malfunctions. Uh, number three, traded documents with five terrorists. And it goes on and on. Number ten is at this point, what difference does it make, like Hillary Clinton said, right? And uh, that's that's the game that they play. Yeah, it was on their. So they have them all. Yeah, they have them all. Sure, sure. Is it? And, cause, yeah, it's all backed up. You bet. They have the the best computer system money can buy. And, of course, if you and I use that kind of excuse that, she, that they're using for Lois Lerner, well, then wouldn't work. It's a joke. Well, he does have a, I think it do, he does actually have one. Uh, and I, if, if it does pass, it only pass in the House as a symbolic thing. Yeah, yeah some of the IRS efforts cremate tell them they have everything. That's good. Here is, uh, here is something that uh, you, George, sent. In January 2014, this competitive contract bid offer was issued by the U.S. federal government. How did they know we would have this many children crossing our illegal borders? Government advised in January, back in January, think about this, quote, for escorts. Now, what that term escorts means is not what you would think on hanging around the streets in in New York City or whatever. These are escorts, government escorts, paid transportation systems, we could say, for 65,000 illegal alien children to be resettled. And it's called the Escort Services for Unaccompanied Alien Children. Yeah, they'd already planned ahead. And we're ready for this. Yeah. It says that it says here that um, the U.S. Immigration and Customs uh, Enforcement (ICE), a component of the Department of Homeland Security (DHS), has a continuing and mission critical responsibility to accept custody of unaccompanied alien children (UAC) from U.S. Border Patrol and other federal agencies and transporting these juveniles to Office of Refugee Settlement, ORR, shelters located throughout the continental United of the United States. Now, there's more on this. I'm not going to take the time to read it. I think you get the general direction. I was watching CBS News here this past week, and they uh, got two beautiful little... Honduras girls that had made their trip, and they put them on new dresses, had their hair done up, and they said that. They, they said that they had had them put new dresses on them and had their hair done up, and then, they, of course, they were then, oh, this journey must have been hard for you. You know, it's not like, uh, do you little girls understand, did they explain to you on this trip anywhere that what you were doing was illegal? Do you understand that what you all have done is broken the law. Of course, it was none of this on there. It was all kind, sympathetic, empathetic talk. And, and what struggles did you have to go through, et cetera, et cetera. Then they showed on the map Honduras, where these girls had come from. 
And all the way, the hard trip, the long, this long road they had to go through to get to McAllen, Texas. Then they, uh, they says, and then you had to go through this long, hard trip. You were flown or shipped up to Michigan in a special home that they already had prepared, which this article is talking about here, for these illegal aliens. Then they found the mother of these two girls in Honduras, and they interviewed her. And she says, well, I clean houses, and I wanted my girls to have a better life. Because uh, life is so hard down here, and, and uh, we're poor. And she says, that's why I paid $10,000 to have my two girls shipped up to the United States. Now, there could be all kinds of excuses for that. It's like, well, maybe she didn't have the $10,000, maybe some drug cartel, maybe the federal government gave her money, uh, maybe she got it as a loan through some kind of a mafia uh, money scheme. I don't know. But $10,000 she came up with to pay to have the, her daughter sit up. Uh, I know right now I don't have ten thousand dollars. I couldn't come up. I couldn't. Sh- I couldn't set my children free. Secondly, this idea that, well, they're poor. Well, then send all of Mexico, send all of them from Nicaragua, uh, and, I, and uh, Honduras, and South America even, ship them all up here because they're all poor. Do you understand what I'm saying? What kind of an excuse is that? So, we're um. We're getting rubbed in our face, Israel. We are getting it rubbed in our face. And I want to say to you, my fellow Israelites, and you can say to those of our persuasion who are just engulfed and, and uh, covered with love. And I'm hearing this from these different groups all the time, that it's just, it's not about uh, being angry. It's not about hate. They stri- it's not about hate. We are about love. We all stop and we pause and we say, yes, that is a, that's a beautiful thought. And we are really all about love. Well, I'm about love too. But I want to, I want to ask you, what kind of love again? Is it just have open hearts and anything goes? And that's the way that these guys are presenting it. They're presenting it as anything goes. Don't you dare say a foul word. Don't you dare cuss. Don't you dare get angry. Don't you dare call anybody names. On the surface level of this issue, it goes much deeper than that. Really? Any thoughts going off in your heads right now as I'm bringing this up to you? Because I want to tell you, Nehemiah, it says in there, and he cursed and smote certain of them. What about Jesus when he comes? He says, thou whited sepulchers. Call them a den of vipers and all this other stuff. My point to you in all of this is we're talking, they're talking about love. And they want to present people as myself, as their Pastor Barley is bad, wicked, and terrible because he doesn't have an unconditional love like we do. Well, you're right about that, my friends. I do not have an unconditional love. I am not espousing being jerks. I'm not espousing cussing. I'm not, a, I'm not espousing being mean or hurtful or abuse, abuseful to anybody. But at the same time, I'm saying we've got to stand our ground and we have to have laws and we have to have absolutes. And we've got to know what they are and we've got to be willing to say no. There's God's, when it comes to the homosexual idea, what do you want to do? Let's just, let's just be loving and, and let's let love solve itself. Let's let the love of God work itself out. Well, God gave you his law to use and to apply. And that's applying love. So we've got to be careful in this. I mean, I could get into Jesus making a whip and, t- and, t- and tell the money changers to get out. Could I not? I could get into all kinds of Old Testament scriptures. But then, what would they say? Well, God wasn't loved. God wasn't loved back then. You see, Pastor, we're New Covenant Christians out, and God's love. 
I can't imagine Jesus doing any of these things that you might be suggesting or thinking about. It was just, we're going to reach everybody through love, opening our hearts up. That's nonsense. I didn't say again, we're supposed to go out there and be bad, wicked, and terrible people. That's not what my point is. But I'm saying there is such a thing as righteous indignation. Is there not? I would like to think that we have a sense of righteous indignation. Or are we going to, how are we going to deal with all the military, national, international problems that we have today if we don't have and exert and enforce laws? It will not work. And families, you fathers and mothers that just want to love your children to death, I've got some examples I could think of right now, but I'm not going to name names because I don't want to, I'm just not going to do that right now. But I know a lot of people, parents in our movement, I won't spank my children. And they tell me that. I won't spank my children. Why not? Well, we, there's just, it's more enlightened not to, basically, and that we don't want to put scars, we don't want to put hurtful scars upon their minds, and if we spank our children, there's going to be hurtful scars upon their mind. Well, I don't have a ton of heart, hurtful scars upon my mind, because I got a ton of whoopings when I was a young man. And I mean real whoopings, not these pat on, stop that, Dave, from my mother. <laughs> And I want to assure you, my mother didn't do that. If anything, it would have been across the face. Bam! Most of the time, she pulled out a belt Dad was, when Dad wasn't around, and she would take that to my behind. And it wasn't just one little whap, whack on my fanny. It was at least a dozen. Now, of course, yeah, yeah you got the razor strap. And you know, uh, I got the switch from the from the from the tree when I was at my grandmother's house a number of times. I can remember that. Oh yeah, wow. And you know, I want to tell you about you know that and a coat hanger. Man, that coat hanger. Whoa, that coat hanger. I swear it had steel in it. <laughs> but uh, you know we're, we. You know what? What's going to stop this thing from Honduras? I mean, or Mexico and all, all these other places that they're down south that they're coming from. Is it love? Is love the answer? Is it, you know, I want, you know as well as I do, this is God's judgment. He's unleashing this as a, a locust, yeah, and other descriptions we could think of. This is a judgment from God. And God's God's wanting to get our attention, Israel. And you lovey-dovey Israelites, nothing is going to change until we start obeying God. And that does involve love. That involves knowing His love. It involves reading His Word. Sharing His Word is love. Putting His Word aside is a lot of them want to do now. And they do. Because, well, I mean, they just... They just want to put it aside as though that's putting the problem aside by not reading God's Word, not studying God's Word, uh, and being Bereans of God's Word, which is what we ought to be doing. We ought to be looking at these events, these national events that are happening, including Iraq, right? Look what's happening with Iraq and, and uh, how Iraq is all of a sudden, you know, here, how many lives do we lose? How many trillions of dollars do we spend over there? And we're losing Iraq. Now, I fully trust God. I believe in God's sovereign purposes, and he's going to work out his sovereign purposes. But it was a form of God's judgment, us being over there. Guess what? When we're coming out, he's using that still as a form of God's judgment against us. Think of the gas prices of nothing else. What do you think is going to happen to your gas prices now? So, 
I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to start seeing quickly $4 a gallon gas, maybe $5 a gallon gas. I won't go beyond that because you're already shaking. I can see you. But God's people need to shake. A whole lot of shaking's coming on. You could say earthquakes are just those physical earthquakes. I got news for you. They're economic tremors too. They're political tremors. They're military tremors. They're war tremors. Okay. Gosh, I was going to get into the Redskins. I'm not going to have time to do that. Was a fun, that's another fun one right there. The, the Redskins. Well, I'm, I'm glad of the I'm glad of the owners. They're, they're they said they're fighting it, and they're Sandy Pat and I. Hey, God bless them. Good. Yeah, it, you can. You no, know, the question is, how can all these tens of thousands of children, these Mexican children, come across the border and get away within Honduras? It's, all the way through Mexico. Yes, yes, yes. But the only way that that can happen, dear friends, if you haven't thought about it, is through complacence, complicity with our of our government. They know. They have a deal with America. They've got. They they. Mexico. Uh, isn't, uh, um, I mean, the Mexican government government could not do this without the approval and the criminal activity of our federal government. That's what I'm going to call it. It's treason. It's treason. All right. Um, Let's go now to the sermon of uh, Psalms for Our Fathers. And uh, I want to, because I didn't, uh, there's a number of thoughts that I wanted to finish on this, and golly, and the more I think about it, we could keep going and going because the uh, the book of Psalms is a blessed spiritual diet. A wide variety of things were given to us in the in the book of Psalms, right? And so we're going to go through a few of them. Let's start by going to chapter one of the book of Psalms. And we will start reading through to verse 3. Blessed is man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Well, do we have the ungodly, first of all, in our government today? Yes, we do. Uh, And that's where the main seat of wickedness is located. Right there. That's where it's being done. Uh... Like we say, Malfunction Junction, Washington, D.C., which is Malfunction Junction on purpose. Yeah, District of Criminals. So, but are people walking to the council of, that they get out of Washington, D.C.? They are. I mean, they're constantly listening to the politicians, if not some of them, even the very president, listening to him. Yes, Yes, the polls less and less are are are, uh, less and are supposed to be coming, and that and uh, that tells me something. It tells me a number of things. You see, I these things get off in all kinds of tangents, and it's it's really another form and variation of wag the dog. How many of you are aware of wag the dog? Tell wag the dog, and there and. And the tail wags the dog is going on continually on lots of different issues in coming out from uh, Washington, D.C. area. Uh, when the politicians open their mouths, uh, when the politicians supposedly pass laws, and uh, when they're making national policies and on, on down the line, um, these these things are just, they're not happening by accident, as some people tend to believe that these things are just by accident. There's a scripture verse that says that the ungodly, and I'm paraphrasing it for you, don't go to sleep at night unless they think of something wicked to do. Now, I want to tell you, 
There's a lot of late night politicians that don't go to sleep until they thought of something wicked to do. That's their appetite. They love to have it so. The Bible talks about dozens and dozens and dozens of scripture verses on the wicked. Why are there so many scripture verses on the wicked and wanting, warning us about these ungodly people? It's because they're out there thinking of ungodly things to do to us all the time. And sad to say, too many ministers and denominations are not warning the people to look and turn to God's Word for sanity, for understanding what's going on, and for coming to the right answers and solutions to our world problems today, and our family problems as well. Amen? But they're not turning to God's Word and not not being encouraged to study these matters out because God Almighty loves us. He loves His people. And the greatest gift besides the Lord Jesus Christ to His people, which is really the Word, Jesus is the Word, so it's all synonymous as far as I'm concerned, is this Bible that we can read and we are to look to it and discern. We're to get spiritual and even a practical uh, understanding of God's Word about what we are to do in our daily life. Listen, a lot of you out there continually to get freaked out. I like to use that term because I think it describes it pretty well. On what's going on in the world today and all the events and how bad the economy is, mostly on how bad the economy is. Let's face it. If the world was going to hell around you today and there were wars and rumors of wars and uh, things were going on, these battles between Russia and the Ukraine or with the Arab worlds and all that, and you were paying 50 cents a gallon of gas and you had job security and the you knew that our uh, the uh, you didn't have to worry about your freedoms and rights being taken away from you. You really wouldn't care all that much about what's going on in the world today. Oh, yeah, you give, you know, it would be a nice little topic of discussion. But it's the economy, isn't it? I won't say stupid. I'll just say it's economy, isn't it? And, and because the economy is bad... It's hard for the people to wake up. You see, yeah, the po- our pocketbooks are tied to our thinking. The decisions that you make. Think about all the decisions that you make in your life, how much of it is based on the economy. Okay, I rest my case. <laughs> But it also says, as you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, if we have ungodly out there, people, and they are thinking of ungodly things, let me tell you something, a little secret which you already know. Every one of their political policies and decisions are economically based decisions. They're not doing it out of love for you. They're doing it out of their commitment and love to the international bankers. Our politicians don't really make the laws. The bankers and their staff and, their, and, and, and the various boards that they have at their disposal. Well, how do you mean that, Pastor? Okay, take the pharmaceutical industry. Pharmaceutical industry is controlled by the bankers. They want certain things done. So they come, and it's all about control. Controlling you, controlling your freedoms, controlling your liberties, and money is at the very core of this. So they go to these different uh, uh, team of lawyers, and they say, we want you to draw up these laws. We want you to draw up a thousand page law on the Privacy Act or, or the, uh, whatever is that, the, um, o- Obama Health Care Act. Right? 
It's based upon control. It's based upon money. It's based upon controlling the uh, whole societal movement and function in our nation today. They have to be able to control us to be able to rule over us. And the way that they control us is through their laws. Their laws are ungodly laws. Their, their laws come from the thoughts of ungodly, wicked people. I kind of feel strange a little bit saying things like that to us because we're the choir. And certainly we ought to know. But the masses of people out there don't think about it in these types of terms. And they have no real understanding of who the wicked are. For the majority of them, they view the wicked as something that's going to come after the rapture. All right. Uh, Now think about this again. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So if you're walking in the counsel of the ungodly, there's a problem. Nor standeth in the, in the way of sinners. In other words, living as the sinners are living. And do, many, and, and do most American Christians, Christian Americans, really understand what it means when it's talking about the way of the sinners? What would they think of as far as the way of the sinners? Well, yeah, uh, you know, Joe, I heard about Joe. Um, he was out with Eddie the other night, and they had a six-pack of beer. And that's what they think the ungodly is, to some degree. They have a very shallow understanding of what, the, what it means. The very same people that would vote in and ordain homosexual as ministers. What are you talking about? Well, just this past week, the Presbyterian denomination voted in favor of expanding more, quote, rights and privileges to the homosexuals of their church and of their community. Hold on one second. I've got to turn this down. Some people get a little cold because of it. Did you all read that article on the Presbyterians? I showed it to my wife. She read it. That shouldn't even be happening. It shouldn't even be close. It it shouldn't even be a suggestion that we'll come together and vote for it. But they came together and voted for it and passed these special privileges for homosexuals in the Presbyterian church. If you're a Presbyterian out there and you're going to uh, Presbyterian church and you're still getting Pastor Barley's sermons here somehow, I don't know how that's possible. Don't be hot or cold. Go with the Presbyterians or wake up, repent, and start doing the right thing. Here's what I suggest. You repent and start doing the right thing. You start obeying God's word over what the Presbyterians say. Presbyterian church, they are a council of the wicked. Come out of them. All right. And it says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's where our delight is to be. I love that. That's the way verse 2 starts out. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's where our heart is. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. We are to do that. They may stay up at night thinking of ungodly causes, thinking of ungodly things to do. The wicked are doing that. But what are we to do? We are to do just the opposite. We are to read God's word, meditate upon it, gain understanding it, and follow its precepts. And he shall be like a tree planted by the river of water. You know, that's a beautiful sight. Because there it is. It's got the soil and it's got the water right there. All the nourishment that it possibly needs. And it's going to grow big and tall and strong. 
We as a people and as a nation cannot grow big, tall, and strong spiritually if we don't do what this, the Word of God is telling us to do here. It's not hard. It's not rocket scientist stuff. That's why I love the Word of God so much. That a fool like me can get up here and, and, and teach the truth of God's Word and be absolutely right. Be smarter than any of these politicians and lawyers and rocket scientists out there. That's a good thought. All right? And that bring forth fruit in its season. Uh, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Man, that's good advice. Is it not, my dear friends? Okay, let's turn now to... Um, Oh, let's go to Psalms 24. Um, There we go. Psalms 24. Let's start reading in verse 4. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. You know what this is talking about? It's talking about Christian character, Christian values, biblical values. We're to have these values. He shall receive the blessings from the Lord and the righteous and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face. Whose face? Yahweh, God Almighty's face, the Lord Jesus Christ. I know some, that irritates some old people out there that want to say, no, Jesus is separate. You know, he's, he's a member of the God. He's one of the gods, but he's not the God. No, there's only one Lord, one God, and that's who they baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, he's our God, Jesus Christ. I don't hide from him. I'm not embarrassed about calling him my God at all. All right, Israel, notice this. That seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Israel is called to do what? They're called to seek the Lord. Now, would you say that's a biblical priority and emphasis according to what we're reading here in the Word of God? I would say that it is. But we're so divided today, we hardly know what our identity is. Even knowing the simple fact that we're Caucasian. No, we're just white people today. Or we're Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Germanic, and kindred people. That's not even really emphasized or it's not politically correct today, is it? To even think in those terms. Especially when we go beyond that to think of our Israelite calling, our Israelite heritage, and getting back in line with God's covenant calling and purposes for his Israel people. That's taboo somehow. Now, Israel, you're called to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Amen? We're called to do this. We're called to do this because God Almighty has called us and given us a covenant calling and given us a covenant purpose. And you look at the average Christian out there, they have no clue whatsoever what God's real calling and purposes are for them. And don't you dare talk about it, Pastor, in context of a, in a racial context at all. Well, now, I just have a question for you. How can I do that? How can I talk about Israel without bringing in race? Is that a too, too much of a politically incorrect thought or statement or question to ask today? 
I don't think that it is because God's word asks it that very question over and over and over in his word. And it is the one thing that is hated. What is hated the most today? What is used to keep any type of a thought from our lips and our mind even on this very issue? Racism. I, you know as well as I do, I haven't heard so, so much talk about racism as when we got this abomination in as our president. And so what I ought to do is recognize the great wisdom of Obama, and I should be quiet on this issue because Obama, they tell me, is our intellectual. Yes, he's such an intellectual, and his, his thought powers and his uh, political understanding and his wisdom is so superior to anything that I would get or that we would get out of God's Word. Right? Wrong. But that's kind of the way that we're made to think about it today, are we not? I'm telling you, and the Word of God tells us the same thing. Race is important. But race isn't what saves us. Race is a calling that God Almighty established and it falls under the category of divine election. You better take special notice of that, my dear Christian friends, because when it, we're talking about divine election, it's not talking about my election or your thoughts or what you want. It's what God Almighty, thus saith the Lord, wants. We better pay attention to that. The problems that we're having as a people, as a nation, because we are not paying attention to that. And I'm not saying that's the only answer. You know me better than that, dear friends. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying it is part of the answer. We cannot push aside who true Israel, the true Israelite people are. And they're the white Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Germanic, and kindred people. But we can't push that aside and progress spiritually and say, I'm going to turn off my understanding to any warnings from the Word of God about multiculturalism. You cannot succeed and say, I only want 30% of, of what I think would be wonderful, according to my carnal mind, of truth from God's Word. The rest of it is just too harsh, it's outdated. It's not pertinent today, Pastor. And that's and, and so you think that going the way of multiculturalism and the way of the Obama administration, what they're telling us, is the way to go? It can't it won't work. Does that do you understand what I'm saying, dear friends? At the same time, a misapplying or doing away with God's laws and the righteous principles, and there's many of them. And don't think for a minute those principles are just given to us in the, quote, New Test, Old Testament. They're also given to us in the New Testament. You think you can read Scripture verses like, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc., and not understand that those are biblical principles as well? When, when, when Jesus comes along and says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, etc. Those are principles, kingdom principles of truth that we have to know, we have to apply, we have to read these truths over and over and over. To the point that we have a well-founded kingdom theology that cannot be misguided or thwarted by the so-called intellectuals of our day. We've got to be adamantly dedicated to the whole counsel of God's Word. Okay, let's go to now to Psalms 25, next chapter down, verse 1. Unto thee... 
O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in Thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. So, the psalmist David understands we have enemies. And you do not want your enemies to triumph over you. Right? Well, that entails quite a bit. And he says in verse 2, Oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Well, when it says let me not be ashamed, it involves the whole counsel of God. It's not, I'm ashamed of half of what you say in the Bible, Jesus, so I'm going to throw that out. But I am I am so proud and of being a Christian with the other 50% that I, my carnal mind thinks is okay. It doesn't work that way. But that's how we're living today. Most people who call themselves Christians are living today. And you cannot have the right results by dismissing half or more of the Word of God. You can't have it, even my dear friends, by, uh, by dismissing 1%. Let me make it to that, bring it to that level. Why, 99% I like, but this one verse here, on, it just irritates me. It just rubs me the wrong way, Jesus. I'm not going to listen to that one. Now, I will admit, I believe, it's this principle that, you know, to whom much is given, much is required, and there's other verses like that, that seem to indicate the more we come in alignment with God's Word, the more blessed we will become. So the more we institute and apply the principles of, of God's word as a nation, as a people, we will become, we will start coming out of this mystery Babylonian system we are under, and we will become more and more blessed. I truly believe that. But at the same time, when we get into the kingdom, we're not going to have 99%, but that 1% or whatever, we're not going to have that. It's going to be the whole council. And it's going to be a light to all of us because we will fully understand the reason and the reason that the light of God's word was given to us. And we're going to spank ourselves because we didn't apply it. We're going to look back and say, wow, we blew it. Now, I know most of us know that right now, but a lot of Christians really don't understand that they're, they are going the wrong way. They're making serious, bad spiritual mistakes. But I don't know how they or any Christian out there can look at our world today and not realize, wow, we are going the wrong way spiritually. How can they miss that? How can they not say, what? Listen to the, did you hear what our president say? Anytime he opens his mouth practically, right? I do that tomorrow. Did you hear what that, I won't say what I called him. Oh. Uh, uh, Barbara come up with a new term. I say abomination. She's, I like abomination, but she says obey me because he's playing God saying obey me. So that's cute. I like that one. But any t- the guy is getting worse and worse. I didn't think it could get worse after his first administration. Now, I don't think he's changed. I think he's always been uh, the moronic, devilish, wicked scumbag that he is. He was a, he's a traitor to our nation. Rapture mentality. Yeah, well, that's part of it. But you know what? Uh, the only way that we're going to come out of our mess, dear Christian friends, is to repent. And that means to turn from our wicked ways and start doing the righteous thing. Applying the right righteous principles. Whether if you like it or not, or agree with it, or it may even hit you. Well, that'll hit me in the pocketbook. Like, what's happening to us today is not hitting you in the pocketbook? I would suggest to you, yea, I would prophesy. You will be far more blessed in the final outcome if we start obeying God's Word. Maybe it'll be through the principle or the thought 
that Ron Paul had when he was running. Yes, he's saying, closing down all the military bases and getting out of all these foreign wars and entanglements will hurt for a while. But think of how blessed we will be when we are able to bring all that money back in the United States and start building up areas that we really need built up. And also, that we can actually bring down the taxes very quickly within a matter of years and and phase out all this uh, international uh, United Nations stuff that's going on now. People ask me, well, what about his son? Do you think his son's going to do that? I don't know. Um, some, some people, of course, I know you're listening right now. I can just hear you. Well, I don't care either way, Pastor. I'm through voting. Uh, okay. Um, you know... I'm not going to say a thing on that. I'm going to just keep going. I've got some things to say, but I'm not going to say it right now. All right. Yea, uh, verse 3. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. In other words, you're not doing it the righteous way. You're, 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 you're uh, transgressing because of carnal reasoning. We have a lot of people that do that. And I want to suggest to you, even if you do it according to God, if you're applying God's law and you're doing it with a wicked motive, God's not going to bless you just because you happen to use His Word to justify yourselves. And some people actually do that. Now, I'm not saying, then don't do God's law. I'm just saying, get your heart right. Clean your heart up. Then do, and then start obeying God's Word. Okay. Um... Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. What a powerful truth here. And what's David saying? This should be the cry of all Christian people. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Show them to me. Let me know what thy ways are, that I may teach thy paths and lead me in thy truth. That's what David says. That's what I want. That's what I know is in your hearts as well, dear Christian friends. And that's scriptural. That's what we ought to be doing. I don't think we ought to be ignorant about what the ungodly are doing. I don't think we need to be ungodly. I mean, we talked about some of their thoughts and some of their laws and some of their schemes at the very beginning of this message here. But I'm not majoring in what they're doing. I mean, my life doesn't revolve around the fact that I have to know what the wicked are doing. Now, I realize we should not be ignorant of the ways of the wicked, but we certainly ought to be spending more time in studying the truth of God's Word, knowing what is the right way. This is the right way. And our hearts ought to be set on fire with doing the right, biblical, God-honoring thing. And we haven't gotten very far into these. But that's really all that David is talking about here in the book of Psalms, is doing the God-honoring thing. And that's what we as a people, Israel, this is our Psalms we are called to do. You want to talk about the importance of our identity. The book of Psalms is... Permeate that this 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 covenant council permeates the book of Psalms for God's people, and yet how many of them are ignoring the truth of God's word? And and our solution to what Obama is doing is right here. Now, people will bring up the fact: Well, aren't we in captivity, Pastor? Yeah, uh, we are definitely, most definitely. In captivity today. Well, what are we to do about it? The hard truth is, there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do on the natural. But when it comes to the spiritual, even, reading God's Word, getting your mind absorbed with His Word, that is such a profound Coming into alignment with the new covenant. 
I'm going to write my laws upon their heart. That's what, our, that's what our main duty, that's what our new covenant duty and responsibility is, is to saturate our minds with the truth of God's word and to walk in that truth. There is so much more that I could say on our captivity and what is going on in mystery Babylon. But I want to remind you of something. Daniel rebelled against Babylon. Can I hear it again? Daniel rebelled against Babylon. Oh, no, he didn't. No, he, I, 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 there's no way. Ba- he understood that we're just supposed to build a house and, and have children and submit to Babylon. And that's what that's all about. Yeah? And that's part of the council as well, within context. But Daniel, when he came to pray, no, I'm going to pray. You can color that any way that you want to, dear friends. But Daniel rebelled against Babylon's orders. I did not say that, hey, now go out there and do whatever you want to against Babylon. That's not what I'm telling you. But I am telling you, Daniel's mind was so saturated with the spiritual truth and guidance of the, from the mind of our divine creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he could do, the, he did the right things, and God instilled within his heart faith to be in that lion's den and withstand those roaring lions. God Almighty can direct his people in the same way, in miraculous ways in the days to come. I want to assure you of that. And when it came to our founding fathers and what they did, that's exactly what our praying, unperfect, yes, they made mistakes, yes, but this is exactly the spiritual guidance and path that our many, not all, but many of our American forefathers used and applied in the American Revolution in our nation today. And we're going to need that same understanding to deal with the problems ahead of us. And it's all about what I've been telling you here. We've got to put on the mind of Christ here. That's the, that's the, that is a paramount thing that we've got to focus on in this time of our captivity of Jacob's trouble. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love reading the book of Psalms here. We're gaining spiritual wisdom, spiritual guidance, and understanding. And we thank you for that, Jesus. And continue to speak to your Israel people. And I, I continue to lift up this Israel message, Lord Jesus. And I know, you know, I get responses from uh, these people that are of the spiritual Israel camp. Well, they can say what they want to against me. And they can be mad at me for uh, speaking out against their uh, guru or whatever you want to call them. But I'm telling you, I knew you know my heart, Jesus. And I'm, I want you people to understand as well, those of you who have ears to hear right now, that when you have these ministers come along and other um, um, piggybacking on ministries like that and kissing up to these false spiritual Israel gurus out there, I pray that you will just awaken mighty truth within your people. And I've seen you do it within me, you've done it within many others out there, that they're flowing along and they're, just, they, they're not really sure, but they're praying, Jesus, give me the truth, give me the truth. That's all I want is the truth, because I know it will set me free. And all of a sudden, they'll be driving along or they're at home and bang, powerful uh, spiritual 